So welcome to No Diagnostic Required, a monthly look at what's happening in the C++ community with me, Phil Nash, and my co-host, Anastasia Kezakova. Anastasia, how are you doing this month? Good. And you? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. Trying to get back into the swing of things after uh, we've got some extension work going on here and it's uh, really been knocking me out recently. Uh, what about you? <laughs> um, you know, I actually um, get back to swimming recently. And I do a three kilometer swim now twice per week. And, you know, I find CPBcast episodes fitting nicely for every swimming session I do. I just had to adjust the sound properly. And maybe the only problem that I can't really laugh at Jason jokes. So like (laughs) kind of hard when you swim. So what about you when you do usually do the podcasts? So usually I I do catch up with them um, also when I'm exercising, but in my case running usually. I haven't been doing that so much the last couple of weeks because of all this disruption we've had going on around the house. I'm getting a bit behind on my CPP cast, I have to say. What was been going yeah. on on CPP cast recently? Um, they were actually discussing the uh, C++ Foundation Developer Survey. Have you checked this episode? No, I haven't heard that one yet. So is that, uh, is that available yet? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there are lots of interesting data in the survey. So um, let's go and talk about it a little bit. So. The Standard C++ Foundation actually has published the results of their annual survey for 2021. So I guess the goal is to the, of the whole research to understand the C++ community better by, uh, by collecting information about the areas of development and experience and, you know, the preferences for language standards and the main pain points and habits related to C++. So there are lots of interesting data inside and I can also tease a little bit our developer ecosystem survey. It's not yet public for 2021, but there is some data in progress. So I have some numbers actually. <laughs> so uh-huh. I can actually compare with the C++ foundation here. Um, and there is a very, I would say, interesting insight, which I um, found in the C++ foundation that uh, most of the collected responses, uh, responses they collected are coming from developers with 10 plus years of experience in C++. So the audience mm. of their Research is very experienced and probably very high skilled. So for us yeah. in Defaca, I guess it's about one to five years for the majority of the audience uh, in terms of C++. So it's not that like high skilled and experience in the language. Um, but anyway, I would say that for the uh, language standards, the data is very much similar between the C++ Foundation mm-hmm. and the Defaca. So like... Um, It's about, I guess, 18% in DevEca and 19% in the C++ Foundation survey of the people who are using C++20 already. Um, So yeah, pretty much the same numbers and quite high, I would say. Uh, By the C++ Foundation, I guess like 60% of the respondents are still not yet allowed to use C++20. But a very good point is that like, if we take the major additions of the C++ major features of the C++20, like concepts, uh, like 46% of the respondents plan to start using them in the next year. For coroutines, oh. it's 36, and for models, it's 38. And it's pretty much the same in the DevEca. So lots of people really are planning to start using the major C20 editions in the next year, which is great, I think. So, yes, it's really. Is it actually situation. planning to or just wanting to? Uh, they like planning to <laughs> so well, hopefully they want it not just forced <laughs> and hopefully they will be allowed to but that actually depends of course so on the project on the code so yeah and no surprise the major pain point uh, the major frustration of the developers is coming from managing libraries the application depends on so like no surprise for c++ ecosystem so package and dependencies managers are still far from being a standard to link in c++ even though we have like such strong players as Conan and VC package. So that's probably why uh, the answer that the library source code is part of my build is a true statement for, mm. uh, I think, 69% of the respondents. And uh, due to C++ Foundation survey, like Conan and VC package, they get something about 16 and 15% respectively. It's a little bit less in our DeFeca, so it's something like 9 and 5% respectively. Maybe that uh, because of the audience, which is different and less maybe experienced with all these, um, you know, pain points with libraries, maybe more students who are like dealing uh, without any package managers. I don't know exactly. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah and of course these all these pain points also uh, depend on the project models so no surprise here like the top three project models are still the same for many many years like it's CMake, it's Make and MS Build. Interesting thing is that actually the two, uh, the the second and the third place swapped. So it's now the Make oh. and then the MS Build. So MS Build is kind of all in. But CMake is really impressive. So in C++ Foundation survey, I guess it's 80% of the respondents who selected CMake. So it's uh, oh. really looks like a very standard tooling now for C++ ecosystem. So in DevHacker, I guess it's about 55%, but also like a very huge part. So, and um, uh, make and MS build, it's kind of 41 and uh, 39 uh, in C++ Foundation and something very similar in our dev hacker. So yeah, the, the top three project models are nearly the same. Um, just the order a little bit um, was updated and the CMake is kind of growing. So, which is no surprise probably. They're like, it's a very popular project model for now. But uh, interesting to see the data. There are lots of other insights. So do check the uh, foundation results, which are available right now. The PDF is published. And so you can find um, by the link. We plan to publish the DevHacker results somewhere in June because we're still processing the data and waiting the data. So because for us, the process of like processing the whole results are a little bit longer. But hopefully we'll be able to share the results uh, in the beginning of uh, June or somewhere around it. And yeah, you can then compare. So I already compared quite big part of the results and I think they are very much aligned. So I'm pretty much sure we are all collecting the correct data here. So that's pretty much true about the ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, some, somehow. Yeah, so that's mostly about the um, this research. Yeah, so go back to the, the package managers that reminded me my previous job, which was back before Conan, actually, but I think, uh, was it B code? was just coming out at the time. That was the predecessor to, to Conan. Yeah. And what we had for many years had the all our dependencies checked into version control approach. And many of them were actually binary dependencies. So they were quite big, um, quite big check-ins. But we, we had been using subversion and that coped with that okay. But at some point we moved to Git. And it just wasn't going to cope with the binary dependencies in there anymore. So I did what any C++ developer would do. And I wrote my own package manager. <laughs> <laughs> which is of course very yeah, specialized so it's much simpler than someone like conan uh, and if i'm still working it today I'll, I'll replace that with with conan but it's uh it's a complex yeah, problem true. definitely <laughs> um so also very reassuring to see that although some people were held back from moving to c plus plus 20 so far there's definitely an appetite for, for getting on there as soon as possible but of course many of our listeners are interested in what's coming next so as usual we have our a section on the uh, what's going on in the standards committee, which is mostly about what we may get, be getting in C plus plus twenty three, sometimes beyond, and sometimes not at all. No guarantees in this section, of course. So the first thing we'll put a look at is something we've been expecting for a while. It is still expected. It's on revision ten now. It's been coming since uh, I think it's twenty sixteen. The the first revision. And of course, the idea itself is is older than that. Uh, in fact, uh, I traced it back to um, Andre Alexandrescu's um, his own library, which is also called Expected. And of course, there's, there's much more history before that. So, yeah, it's just been baking for a long time. And uh, again, just to use the pun once more, <laughs> we've been expecting it in the standard for a while. Many of us were expecting it to arrive in twenty, but it didn't quite get in 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 time. So. You would hope that this should get in quite quite soon, and I'm hoping it does, because once we get uh, still expected in, we can actually build on top of that, and particularly with uh, monadic operations. But before I get to that, you will probably just take a moment to remind people what stood expected actually does. And it's a type, or a template really, for representing either a value, or if the value is not available for some reason, some error or some other type that, that tells you why. Uh, simple as that, really. And it's mostly intended to be used as a return value in places where you might otherwise use an exception, but for one reason or another, you don't want to. Um, and there's lots of nuance that I'm <laughs> skipping over there, but that, that's basically what it comes down to. And it's probably best explained um, in a, an example. So again, if you're listening to this in audio, but you have a podcast player that shows chapter art, 
uh, that should be showing on the screen now. This is actually taken from a slide from one of my talks, uh, Dawn of a New Era, that I was giving a couple of years ago. Uh, so you can see there's a there's a function there, parseInt, that returns a std expected of int or std domain error. So the the error type there is happens to be an exception type. It doesn't have to be. And in the failure case, it just returns std make unexpected of that domain error. And that's really just for overloading purposes, so that it can uh, choose the right overload of the uh, the constructor. But otherwise, it's just a normal type that it's returning. This happens to be sort of expected. Uh, now, in the usage at the bottom, you can see that up until the else case, it's almost exactly like using still optional, and that's deliberate. So it's sort of pointer semantics. Um, you can you can dereference it, you can test it against um, you know the, the Boolean conditional operator. But the difference comes in the else case when you have an error, you can now ask it what the error is. You say dot error, that gives you the error type. Because it's an exception here, we can say dot what on that. So looks pretty simple and pretty straightforward. But it's not all roses. That there are some downsides to doing it this way, especially compared to exceptions. It's a lot more verbose. Doesn't look it in this case, but to, to use an example from Cy Brand's blog from, uh, from a few years ago, um, there's an example presented of doing a series of operations that involve stood expected. And, and in each one, you have to test the return type. If, it's, if it fails, then you return back out of the, the function so you can collect all the errors at the end. Uh, and if it continues, you've got to dereference it and, and pass it on. Each individual bit is straightforward enough, but when you put it all together, it gets very, very verbose. Now, the reason I'm you know, showing you Cy Brand's blog here is because he was actually leading up to his proposal for, sorry, their proposal for a um, uh, extra monadic operations on, on stood expected and stood optional as well. And they have actually proposed it for stood optional, but they can't yet for still expected because still expected is not in the standard yet, which is why I want it to get in there. So how does it look with, with Cy Brown's proposal? Here's the example from their, uh, their own library in the, the TL namespace. So you can see at the bottom is a fraction of the code. Everything just sequences nicely. So the and then and map operations are the, the monadic operations. You don't even have to know what a monad is to, to see how this works. To get it back much closer to, uh, to exceptions. Of course, you can take that even further still. You get something like uh, P0709 that we've talked about before as well, which is more like baking something like stood expected into the language so that you can present it in a more exceptions like interface. But also to just to show you that again, here's another example from my own talk where I uh, boil it down, but this time using uh, lambdas instead of uh, free functions is uh, cited just to give you a, a comparison. So as you can guess, this is uh, of great interest to me. I've done a few talks on it myself. That's why I'm, I'm laboring the point a bit, but I'm really keen to get, um, certainly still expected into the standard, hopefully the monadic operations as well. But I think that's not the end of the story when it comes to error handling. And I think we do need something like P0709, the uh, static exceptions proposal as well. But this is definitely a, a good step uh, good to see that stood expected is still going through the process. So that's that stood expected. Um, anything you wanted to say on that, Anastasia, before I move on? Yeah, it actually looks really cool. I mean, it's it looks very functional, I would say, especially the example by the Simon. So yeah, I'm the only thing that probably I'm wondering is like. How does that look for those who are not with the more than C++ right now? <laughs> Will they be a lot of surprise to them? But yeah, it looks much shorter and much more readable. And I think that's the major goal of all the changes in the language right now, to make it simpler and safer and to make it actually readable is a nice point. And also, actually, you mentioned it's like revision 10. So how much work yeah. was, was done there, actually? Um, so yeah, I'm like just surprised by that many revisions. So probably there is... Indeed, a very huge piece of work, very fruitful work put into that. So, yeah, it should be, should be great. Waiting for that. <laughs> yeah, it's conceptually quite simple, and there's not many affordances to it. So I think most of the work has gone into just making sure that every little detail is, is just right. Uh, I know so there it's were very some, polished. Yeah, 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 exactly. 
I know there were still some concerns um, recently, but th this latest revision is really just about rebasing it on the uh, the draft standard itself, rather than uh, the uh, library fundamentals TS, which it was targeting before. So th this is another indication that the, the committee is actually taking it seriously for inclusion into the standard as a, uh, a really fully fledged vocabulary type. So that's good. Yeah, true. Okay. Moving on, the next proposal I want to talk about is uh, P2128, multidimensional subscript operator. This is a really simple addition. And if you just look at the, the Tony table uh, right in the opener, uh, the highlighted part, again, if you're looking at the visual, uh, really tells you all you need to know. If you've got some type that can act to some sort of multidimensional array, matrix, grid, that sort of thing, where you have well, multiple dimensions to address an element, Previously, you've always had to perhaps overload the call operator to do that, as in the before case. Whereas more naturally, you'd want to use you know, the square brackets subscripting operator. But of course, that can only accept one argument at the moment. So this just extends the language to allow multiple arguments. Seems simple enough. Why didn't we get this years ago? The reason is, of course, that comma operator, which could be overloaded. And that was getting in the way and would make it uh, ambiguous. So. For C++20, we actually managed to deprecate the comma operator within the context of the subscripting operator. That was a P1161. Deprecate uses of the comma operator in subscripting expressions. I'll, uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. So that sort of paved the way to make this possible. And this is now the next logical step. But it's actually quite a tight timeline. Deprecating it in C++20, and now we have to make it uh, we'll have to remove it from the standard in 23, if it's going to go into 23, in order to give us the um, comma operator in, sorry, the multiple arguments to the subscripting operator. So if that does get into 23, that's quite a tight turnaround from deprecating to removing something from the standard. I don't think we've ever done it, anything that fast before. Of course, it may not make it into 23 for that reason, uh, but otherwise, one of those nice little things that will be good to have. Um, even if it doesn't really enable anything new, it just allows us to express common things uh, more easily. And I think that's always a good thing. So hope that that gets in. Um, and then the next one, which is something that I've been waiting for for a long time. Uh, it's just called simply zip. <laughs> and, and this is uh, an extension to ranges. Uh, one of the uh, the ranges views that have uh, been talked about for a long time, but we, we couldn't quite get it in for 20. Uh, there's a few of these. In fact, there's a whole paper on things that are going to go into ranges uh, targeting 23, the, the, the plan for C++ 23 ranges. Uh, this is one of the, the, the foremost of them. And it's simply a way to take uh, two or more um, existing ranges of the same size and literally zipping them together into a single range, where each element of the range that it yields, because it is a view, is a tuple of all the, the current elements that it's iterating over in the, in the child ranges. And a very common case for wanting to do this is before C++11, when we just had to iterate everything by, by index uh, with, it, with an index counter, uh, it's nice if you're rotating uh, an array, you'd always have the index handy as well, and you'd often want to do that, do things with that. When we've got range-based for loops or, or maybe move to algorithms, suddenly that index disappeared. We thought, well, how do we get that back? And you have to do awkward workarounds like declaring outside the loop and then explicitly incrementing it. Never quite felt natural. But if you can zip your container with something like um, IOTA, which will give you a, an increasing counter as you go, You'll get back that functionality. I thought it's never quite that simple, is it? And <laughs> there is a problem with using IOTA in that way. I think you can do it in specific cases, but in the general case, it's not quite right. I forget the details now, but it's something to do with um, the um, the difference type and uh, the, the the size of the the counter. So they've actually proposed separately something that wraps all that up into a single concept, and that's um, fuse enumerate. P2164, not in the current mailing, but what I'd mention here in this context. 
And that will just give you exactly that. It's more like a Python enumerate if you ever use that, where it will give you a, a sort of packaged up a zipped range of the thing you actually want to enumerate and, and the index as well. So yielding those uh, individual uh, tuples or pairs. So that's one to watch as well. Uh, I think that one got stalled up. The, there was some discussion over uh, the return type, I think, but I haven't been following that so closely. But uh, certainly zip um, is, uh, is really useful. And that paper actually includes not just zip itself, but uh, there's a zip transform adjacent and adjacent transform. And adjacent is useful because it actually gives you um, not, not two separate uh, ranges zipped together, but the same range zipped with itself, but off by one. So you can have the, the current element and the next element, if you like, uh, and then the special handling for the edge cases. So uh, going to be very pleased to see that one make it in. Hope they uh, uh, zip to getting that done. Yeah, that looks impressive, actually. <laughs> Here's a, uh, an example, by the way, of enumerate in practice. Uh, I forgot to show the Tony table. So you can see that you can just use a range-based for loop over the uh, enumerated range and then and get the tuple out. Moving on to back to contracts again. We've, I think we've spoken about contracts at least the last two or three episodes. This time we're just defining contracts. And I think I mentioned last time actually that we're starting to see the, the results being yielded from um, SG21, the, the contracts study group that got together in the wake of contracts being pulled out of C20. And uh, certainly one of the problems that we had uh, before contracts were taken out, and even to some extent after that, is lots of people have very strong ideas about what, what contracts are, but they don't necessarily agree with each other. But there was certainly a an element of people talking past each other, not necessarily talk about the same thing, but using the same terms. And that got really confusing. That was really at the center of a lot of the confusion. So this paper is recognition of that, and it's just trying to pin down some specific definitions of some commonly used terms when we're talking about contracts, uh, particularly some of the ones that have, have been problematic. Uh, some of them are sort of fairly um, abstract sounding like uh, the transitive abstract machine violation um, or made up things like uh, Hiram bugs. So <laughs> bugs that depend on things that um, weren't actually intended, but now, now people depend on that. It's difficult to change. Uh, contract smoothing. Uh, but then there's things that, well, we think we know what they mean, but actually people still have different ideas about what they actually are, <laughs> like just undefined behavior or unspecified behavior. Turns out we need a, a written definition of what we're talking about when we talk about those things so that we can be absolutely sure we're all on the same page. So we're really still in the, the stage of laying all the groundwork for redefining what contracts are. So a lot of work going into it. It's something that people are taking really seriously. We, we really want this. Still don't know if it's going to make it to 23 if we're still at this stage, but uh, I'm hopeful we're going to get it right when it comes. So. Glad to see all that work going in. Do you have any uh, opinions on contracts, Anastasia? Ah, not really, just hoping we'll get them done and not cancel at the very last moment as before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've, I've been giving a few talks recently on, on different things, so they seem to be very different topics. Like um, uh, OO considered harmful last year, where I talked a lot about polymorphism. And this year I've been talking about the solid principles. And um, in particular, a Liskov substitution. Turns out all of these things are really heavily tied in with what contracts actually are. It's all about, they're all about maintaining invariants, uh, preconditions, and so on. We really need a solid understanding, if you pardon the pun, of what contracts are to make full use of these other facilities as well. Everything else builds on it. So, yeah, it's not just about you know, testing your preconditions, it's about describing the, the design of your code in general, much more than... Yeah, and I would say that better. contracts actually, uh, they give a great new opportunities for the tooling because like you can build some interesting code analysis things on top of that. So, mm. and I'm really waiting patiently for that. 
so to see what we could do in terms of the tools so to help people actually to you know to live with these contracts like to use them in a nice way yeah absolutely that's a big part of the the original contract specification was making machine readable or machine uh, actionable even and uh, even perhaps enforceable or checkable at uh, compile time so i hope that's still going to make that make it in but certainly yeah lots of um, lots of scope for spotting things that can be problematic particularly around undefined behavior so we will keep a close eye on that and we'll keep reporting on it i'm sure so talking of tooling for all this uh, that we've been talking about perhaps it's a good time to talk about the sea line release that we just had yeah <laughs> we actually <laughs> released sea line 2021.1 so maybe because of that i'm in kind of in a very old style uh t-shirt with <laughs> old sea line um like previous branding with a cutie uh, sea lion animal um but yeah so speaking seriously so we released uh the first major update this year and like code analysis project models and remote development uh are all in the focus for this time and if you ask me like to to name three top enhancement in this update i would personally highlight postfix completion for c and c plus plus uh, with it, you can actually pass the expression you've just typed to a free function as a first argument. Mm. And you will especially like it if you miss the uniform function call syntax yeah. in C and C++. The second one would probably be global data flow analysis. So it will capture things like dangling pointers and null pointers referencing uh, for you within the whole translation unit, not just function bodies as before. And actually, there's an interesting story of the evolution of the code analysis in C-Line and data flow analysis in particular. So we introduced it first time in the very first versions, then it evolved and it was moved to Clang D based engine, I guess a couple of years ago, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but it was mostly the local data flow analysis, which is like, it, it was really powerful and it is really powerful, but it is analyzing only inside the function bodies. So we decided to expand the analysis to the whole translation unit. And a good point is that, as it usually happens with, when you're like introducing something huge and you're reworking the whole um, uh, the whole thing, so we kind of optimize the performance for the local DFA as well. So it happens that mm. the local data flow analysis started performing actually better after we introduced the global uh, DFA, even though it now collects more data for the global checks. But yeah, it, it's kind of working nicely. And nice. the first thing here would be the branch coverage. Uh, we talked about it last time, um, yeah. which was added, and also the dynamic analysis in general, which moved to remote mode as well. So it's now not supported locally, but also in the remote mode. Um, so this would be the three personal top uh, things in this update. But also there are, of course, like embedded developers uh, would find uh, like new Mistra checks. It's now like for Mistra C++ uh, 2008, it's like 43 checks out of something more than 200, I guess. And for Mistra C, it's like uh, 58 out of uh, 160 plus something. Um, also, there is like Clazy Analyzer uh, integrated for those who are with the Qt projects and some initial support for remote make files um, and a new like service for a collaborative development, which we call Code With Me. So you can uh, try it out for collaborative development, peer programming. So that's mostly about the update. So you can find more details by the link uh, on our site and our blog. And if you're wondering what's next, we actually already published the roadmap for the next release for 2021.2. So the major things here, like we'll continue with the code analysis and we'll start looking at the lifetimes implementation. So hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be bringing uh, like checks for the lifetime uh, in the scope of the function bodies. And we'll also uh, do our best to support the uh, JSL annotations. So if you annotate the code so that we can provide some checks based on that. Um, we're also working on a way to specify supported features, headers, search paths, defines, uh, whatever, if the compiler is not officially supported natively by C line. So we call this feature a custom compiler so that you can work still mm -hmm. with it in inside C line. Uh, the next big topic is CMake presets. So we started work on it. Um, 
it will be divided into parts so i'm not sure how many parts will be able to deliver in the actual release so but the first part is kind of obvious load the presets uh successfully in c line and like make them work uh and later we'll consider some editor for the presets inside the id and some way to edit it nicely and to save it back to the uh, presets files um as for the make files we'll still have some big uh depth here which we need to address is to support the pre-configure step so that you can work with it nicely in c-line mm -hmm. without some uh, manual actions um like as usual lots of work in debugger so to improve the current functionality and the very notable remote ldb currently in plans um some updates to profiling and embed it um, and in terms of embedded for example we're now working on multi-threaded airtos aware debugging so hopefully we'll be able to deliver that but if not yeah we'll we'll just deliver it um in the next release anyway that's the major scope so phil what's your most anticipating feature for the next release if i tell you that then it won't happen so uh... <laughs> <laughs> let's try <laughs> yeah i'm really hoping for uh, better support for for Docker. I know that's uh, something we've, we've been waiting for for a long time. Uh, I know that we're we're planning it, but um, I'm not sure if it's on the on the plan for this year. Yeah, there 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 are a few things in the list um, like related to Docker. Some is a setup, and also we plan to adopt uh, the run targets feature from the IntelliJ platform, mm. and it will probably be also related to Docker and to easy setup for the Docker. So we'll see. Not sure yeah. about the uh, point two release, but the work uh, has already started, so you might hope for some changes here. Yeah, definitely uh, a long road ahead, whichever way you look at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about uh, ReSharp C++? Yeah, like as usual, we have the whole release train. So ReSharp C++ was also updated, also got a uh, 2021.1 update. So that's our extension for Visual Studio for C++ developers. Uh, the biggest change is syntax style settings with accompanying inspections, quick fixes, and context actions. So we talked about this uh, in March already as well. So you can configure which syntax contracts you prefer or have to use maybe due to them, some style guidelines forcing you. So and we all know Phil will be config configuring East const there. <laughs> so yeah, sure. <laughs> Talking about the language, many new C++ 20 editions uh, were actually updated in this update, like class type in non-type template parameters, new octet rules, and coroutine-related syntax in uh, regular and postfix code completion. So actually, coroutine support was uh, introduced, I guess, something about nearly three years ago in 2018.2 update, but the completion was updated just now. The regular completion mm -hmm. and the postfix completion got the coroutine template. And for game developers, Unreal Engine 5 initial support is probably a big thing. And uh, lots of other updates to Unreal Engine support. And talking about the game dev and the Unreal Engine support, so I can't avoid mentioning Writer for Unreal Engine, uh, which is in preview right now for those who are doing games with Unreal Engine. And it's now generally available on macOS. That's a huge, big thing. Yeah. We also released in April. And it works with the U project format directly, which means you can avoid the step of generating the Xcode project or the solution uh, on Windows. And that actually saves you time, not just on the initial project generation, but every time you add a new class, you actually save the time and avoid this uh, project model generation. So thanks to the direct support for the U project. So, and of course, all the C++ improvements I was talking before, like the syntax style support and the C++ 20 and the rest, they're also delivered in uh, Rider for Unreal Engine because it's actually using the ReSharper C++ as a language engine. So, and the Unreal Engine support itself also improved um, in both. So, yeah, so the game developers will find a new uh, shiny tool <laughs> in their tool set. So, yeah, that's about it. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> Another big release. Or releases, should I say. Uh, um, but yeah. Talking of releases, I think we, we can look beyond JetBrains products as well. Uh, there's been a GCC release. Can you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, like huge things actually are happening around us as well. So GCC 11, so you're probably wondering how the compilers are doing these days in terms of the modern C++ standards. And yeah, hey, here we have the GCC 11. 
finally delivering uh, at least some support for C++ 20 modulus. So it still has some incompleteness, I guess, and it requires the minus F modulus TS completion flag to be passed, but it's there. So uh, if you <laughs> manage to find a project model which already supports modulus, <laughs> You can give it a try. So yeah, no push to see make here, really no push. Uh, but yeah, that that's a good thing. Uh, and there are also lots of other C plus plus twenty additions uh, to GCC eleven. So like constable virtual functions, also fixed stat for aggregates, and some more. And they even added some C plus plus twenty free draft uh, features. So like literal suffix nice. for uh, sign t, uh, size t signed, and. Um, like, yeah, the release also brought updates for C20 and C20 free changes to the Lipstud C library. And I'm like especially happy with the STD source location delivered. So we discussed it also last time. And uh, it helps to eliminate macros from the, like, for example, debug logging Guinea code. And it's there in GCC 11, so you can start using it. Um, and besides that, a new version actually defaults to uh, GNU, uh, GNU, C++, uh, GNU++ 17 instead of like 14 standard. So that yep. might cause some porting issues. And the like GCC, um, they even have a huge page called like porting to GCC 11, uh, which you might want to check out uh, if you are moving to the new version of the GCC. So yeah, and... Probably, yeah, the biggest thing here is models, but there are lots of other uh, additions from the uh, new language features to the uh, GCC compiler. So do you plan to start using GCC 11 with some models? <laughs> Definitely want to give it a try, because uh, as, as we all know, modules is going to solve all of our problems, including the problem of not having modules yet. So we'll, we'll see if that actually works out. Yeah, yeah. Now you have something to try out. You just need to find a proper project model which supports the models. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we have the compiler. <laughs> enough, yeah, but you we're building, uh, bu building the thing. Yeah. You right, mentioned two on. features there from C plus plus twenty uh, that are now in GCC that will make a big difference to uh, to the implementation of catch or catch two, maybe catch three or four. <laughs> I'm not sure yet. Catch twenty. Um, <laughs> so module support would allow us to move away completely from the, the header only model. And in fact, that, that work's already happening with, with catch two. Uh, catch two is no longer a header only. And you don't have to have modules to make that work, but it just makes it a bit nicer. Uh, but the other thing you mentioned, of course, was source location. Uh, allows us to, well, that in itself doesn't allow us to get rid of the macros, but it certainly takes us a big step closer. Uh, but there are other features in 20 as well that uh, can make a big difference to test frameworks in general. And I know uh, Chris Jusiak's framework is is all in on, on C++ 20 and showing how it can be done. So definitely really interested in, in that space, seeing how that evolves. And as these compilers get that support, it'll be interesting to see that actually trickle down to, to everyday code as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the C++ 20 world that we're now entering. Yeah, that's true. It's great to see that the tooling is like moving to that direction, at least. So the IDs are moving, the compilers are moving. So let's just wait for the others and start mm. with this new shiny world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talking of new shiny worlds, we've got uh, Microsoft and uh, NVIDIA getting together. Yeah. Yeah, Microsoft and NVIDIA seems to have partnered around the better CUDA support in Visual Studio Code. And it was announced uh, in both NVIDIA and Microsoft blogs. So talking about just the pure VS code. So uh, you can find IntelliSense for CUDA kernel functions there right now. I guess it's like auto completion and go to definition and find references and some refactorings like rename symbols. But there is actually more. So NVIDIA announced uh, the, uh, as they call it, Inside Visual Studio Code edition. This is a special edition of the Visual Studio Code for NVIDIA, and this later one additionally promises built-in debug support for GPU kernels, like standard breakpoints and stepping abilities for both CPU and GPU, like the same UI works just for both cases, and conditional breakpoints with expression evaluations, and to inspect GPU and kernel state, the call states, the register and variables view. So I guess the builds are not yet publicly available, but you can fill in the interest form on the NVIDIA site and probably wait for some preview. 
I guess that's um, like very much of interest for those who are doing the QDA development um, to find not just the better uh, intelligence in the editor, but also some uh, smart uh, debugging features there uh, with all this experience with the breakpoints and regular stuff you just got used for regular debug. You just get it for GPU now, which is kind of cool, I guess. So let's see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah so uh, interesting news. Definitely seem to be an increasing convergence between just normal C++ and, and GPU. Uh, coding, including down to the tooling support, it seems. Yeah, and actually, I guess the recent CMake also got some updates for CUDA, so they also got some special features for CUDA, so it seems that the CUDA is just expanding its adoption to, to the tooling, So and it looks good to me. So I think that that's a good move. Mm, yeah. Talking to Microsoft, they've got a conference coming up, uh, Pure Virtual C++. Which, um, yeah, but for, for the looks of uh, Gabby in the picture, it looks like a very welcoming conference, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I think that's that's a great picture. So, yeah, uh, Microsoft actually announced a free one day virtual conference for C community, it will run on May 3, so a little bit clashing with C now. Um, but yeah, yeah still, um, uh, I guess the sessions are pre recorded, but you'll be able to ask questions, so which is like always good. And the program is very much focused on Microsoft tooling and on the things, on the topics uh, which are of interest for them in particular, like modulus and CMake. So there are two talks on C++ modulus explaining like the basics, the uh, visibility and reachability concepts and giving the overall recap of what's there uh, for C++ modulus in practice. And I guess uh, they will be showing some basic support they already have for modules, like some highlighting and parsing some uh, specific keywords. Um, also like the CMIC presets, I've already uh, mentioned them uh, in the context of our plans in C-Line. And Visual Studio and Microsoft people were actually actively participating in the uh, presets design. And I guess they had huge discussions in the CMIC mailing list. And no wonder there is uh, an interesting collaborative work and a talk uh, which they will be doing together with the Kitware um, representatives on a brand new CMake Preset support in Visual Studio. Uh, so yeah, that's also kind of interesting um, to see how it looks like and what's the effort behind the whole CMake Presets concept. Um, and yeah, as the biggest pain point in C++ is still managing dependencies, as we can see from the foundation survey, so an update on VC package will be presented. So you might be interested in that as well. And also their recent um, topic of the high interest for them is also address sanitizers. So they will be presenting uh, a talk about the static and runtime analysis tooling for like some better good quality, talking especially about the address sanitizers. So yeah, kind of interesting event. Uh, again, a little bit clashing with C++ now. So if you're uh, signed for the C++ now conference, you might have some um, you know, tough choice. I'm not sure how how the times is if they are conflicting or not. So since the C++ now is in the, I guess, Aspen uh, time zone, in the Colorado time zone. So, but like this one is um, somewhere UTC midday. But yeah, anyway, um, I guess there will be recording for both. So you can check later everything. So, yeah. And talking mm -hmm. about the C++ now, so, um, like, as I mentioned that, it will be clashing a little bit with the uh, Microsoft conference. So C++ Now actually will be running next week. So it's from May 2 to May 7, and the program is already available. And so, yeah, the videos will be uh, published after the conference. So JetBrains is actually one of the video sponsors. So we um, made sure that <laughs> you'll get the videos delivered uh, because that's a very, uh, it's very good conference with a great, de uh, like, in-depth content and I think uh, having the even just to check the video but if you're lucky enough and you're in the conference uh, at least in the like online conference so it's all online this year um, so yeah you might check the shuttle and you might want uh, to select which talks uh, you're gonna um, listen to and I would like just to highlight the keynote sessions so this year they're actually really great so I'm impressed with the lineup for the keynote so it's Bill Hoffman the founder of Kitware, if you don't know. So that's the company behind the CMake. And like, no surprise, Bill will be talking about the um, 
about the CMake. <laughs> so the talk is called CMake One Tool to Build Them All. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the most popular project model in C++ ecosystem right now, as you might see from the foundation or JetBrains uh, DevEco survey. And the keynote session will cover the history behind the project model, some challenges uh, they went through, and the most important, like, modern features. And hopefully we'll, like, shed some light on the, like, main philosophy behind the technology at first hand. And you probably can ask any questions to Bill regarding the CMake <laughs> and how you uh, feel about the project model and their, like, directions for the future. Um, so, yeah, kind of very interesting keynote. Another one is from Bryce. Um, like, it's about like Bryce is working in Nvidia, but also he is a chairman, uh, the chair of the Standard C++ Library Evolution Working Group. And in this talk, Bryce will share the principles that are shaping the evolution of the C++ standard library. So, and hopefully, he will answer the question that bothers many C++ developers who follow the language evolution uh, these days, like. What should go to standard library and what should know? Because I guess that's the major point for discussions right now with all the networking TS and other stuff. Quite many people are raising this concern that maybe that's that's a good change, but maybe that's not a change for the standard library. And on the like um, other side of the table, there are people who are saying now we we have to get it into the standard library. So let's listen to the uh, like the chair of the working group and his position on like uh, how it. Uh, should be shaped and how it actually works right now. So very much yeah. interested in the keynote. And the third one is Tony. So yeah, Tony Tables, that's the same Tony actually. So yeah, undoubtedly the best presenter in the C++ community and maybe even wider. And yeah, the person behind the famous Tony Tables approach. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the keynotes uh, are dedicated to solid principles that you've already mentioned here. So they are celebrating the 20th birthday uh, for the solid principles. And if you are still not aware of what the acronym stands for, the doc will give you an answer and also discuss how it fits into the you know modern C++. So if they are still practically useful and if they are still kind of useful to um, everyday C++ developers. So I think that would be a great keynote. And especially given that that's Tony, I would expect a very, really a great, uh, great talk. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think we both also have talks. I'm still preparing my slides. <laughs> I'm still in the progress of reworking them. Um, so I will be talking about the code analysis for C++ in its modern shape and form. So it's called Code Analysis++. Uh, it's on Tuesday. So, and yeah, hopefully I will be able to finish my slides <laughs> by that. <laughs> and uh, Phil will join the uh, Eduardo Madrid to talk about the polymorphism. So, Phil, how's your slides are going on? <laughs> um, I, I think we pinned down a title slide, so we're making uh, strong progress. Good, great job, there. great job, great, great progress. <laughs> we also come up with an interesting concept for how we're actually going to run the whole thing, but you actually have to come hmm. to the talk to find out what that is. Oh, That's cool. going to be on Wednesday. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so you have slightly more time <laughs> <laughs> than me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that, but, that extra day yeah. counts. Oh, yeah, yeah. But hopefully, yeah, we'll be able um, to deliver a good content. So um, no pressure, no pressure. Just the C++ no, Now all. conference. <laughs> yeah, so you can check the shell if you're in, uh, if you're registered for the conference, just uh, prepare your shell for the next week. And if you're not, just find and, uh, you know, tick the talks you're going to check later when they're available as a recording and be back to them because I think there will be great talks there. The whole shadow looks like impressive to me, not just the keynotes. I think uh, the whole week would be great. Yeah, just sad that we're not in Aspen. <laughs> not in yeah, it's always a great yeah. conference. Uh, if you want a, a bit of a warm up for Tony's keynote, you can listen to the last CPB chat that we did with uh, with Tony and um, uh, Klaus Stiegelberger uh, about the study principles. And I made a bit of a confession there, because when we last had Tony on uh, a year ago now, he mentioned then that he was going to do a, a talk on the solid principles at some point, and he was going to call it Solid Revisited, which is in fact what his keynote's called. I'd forgotten that. Um, and the talk that I did for the ACC conference this year, I called Solid Revisited. <laughs> so we now both have a talk of the same name. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's very useful for you. <laughs> Anyway, naming's hard. So 
yeah. listen to that episode. So you can uh, get a bit of the background for, for the talk as well, actually. We, we talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Okay. Can we use Tony tables to compare the talks? <laughs> the, the before and after. We should do, really, yeah. Um, no, I don't think yeah. Tony's really into that all that meta stuff, though. That's the trouble. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we are we're running quite long. We've got to wrap up with one last and finally segment. So, as usual, well, this is a, a thread from from Reddit. Uh, what is possible in modern C plus plus that wasn't in C plus plus ninety eight? Do you have any views on this before I dig into it? Uh that sounds like a great question. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, staying in C plus plus twenty in the year of twenty twenty one with the twenty three approach. And good question to ask. Like, <laughs> yeah. so what's there in the thread? What the people are suggesting? <laughs> so I think there is a um, a general consensus that the question really means what's actually uh, was not possible at all in the language in C++ 98, compared to what did you just have to do differently? So even a really useful feature like lambdas doesn't count, because you can consider that just syntactic sugar for what we could do before. But there are a couple of things that, um, that don't count, that, that they, they just weren't possible in a standard portable way for C++ 11, uh, particularly the, the, the C++ memory model, and uh, especially with respect to threading. Of course, we had threading libraries before we did it, but it wasn't standard. It was a non-standard extension, if you like, because it's all platform dependent. Not just platform dependent, but C++ didn't have a memory model for it, which means there were no guarantees that it would play nicely. That came in with C++ 11. We can now do threading <laughs> since C++ 11. And there's a few little things like that, and most of it comes down to things that interact with the operating system. Because some of those interactions are or at least the guarantees are at the language level, rather than things you can necessarily have with a library. You could write a library, but they may or may not work, not, not guaranteed. So that's quite an interesting thought experiment to think about it that way. But I think personally, and, and some of the, the people in the thread also think the same way, you can relax this a bit and say, well, what about things that yeah you could do before, but just make such a dramatic difference, just how much simpler and more expressive it is in modern C++, whether that's C++ 11 or later, I think they count as well. And, um, the, the main examples I can think of, of course, well, Lambda's the obvious one, but, but also things like variadic templates. If you ever had to write something that really needed variadic templates before we had them, you could do it, but it was a, a horrendous workaround with uh, dozens, maybe even hundreds of, of overloads of different types of templates with different variants variations of const and you probably stamped them out with macros and yeah we, we did it <laughs> well we didn't like it um you, you got any uh, examples of your own um i'm just thinking right now that you're right that the expressiveness of the language has increased dramatically so and even though you can still do pretty much like the same stuff just like code but you can code in a like nice and more readable way which is very much important i mean to support the code base to maintain it. But also like being from the tooling side, I would say that um, like for all these years, not just the language improved, but we improved with the language, the whole ecosystem. And that's mm. also like the contribution of the language revolution. I mean, like we started caring about the language becoming more toolable and the tools actually started appearing. And we now have like, not that we have some kind of a standard tooling, like we still don't have something which is like a standard dependency manager or a standard, you know, project model. But uh, like there is this um, movement to some standardization of the something around the tooling as well. And I think yeah. that's also part of the language evolution, not just directly related, but still. So like making the language, uh, we introduce many new things to the language and the tool, we understand that the tooling can help and we understand the value and we keep the language toolable. And that's very important to me. Like, so yeah, we, we could still code in macros, you know, like we can take the old style C++ and code in macros everything. I was coding in macros for many years and I was pretty much happy with it. But like, yeah, I would prefer something better, like um, uh, source location. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, there, there, there's so many things, little things, when you think about it, that you don't even think about now because they, they make everything so much nicer. But yeah, we, we lived without them before. So yeah, interesting thought experiment. Uh, I think that thread is still ongoing, so uh, <laughs> I'll put a link in the show notes so you can go and have a look for yourself. Um, and that about wraps it up for this month, I think. Uh, again, we've just sort of scraped in right at the end of the month. <laughs> Um, it'd be interesting to see what the next month brings. Again, if you have any ideas that uh, you want us to to cover, then uh, do let us know. I'll put the uh, email address up on the screen or in the in the show notes. Other than that, just um, remains for us to say uh, goodbye. Bye.